Well, hello everybody. Um, trying something a little different today, and um, I hope it works. Uh, if, if, if not, well, you can't blame a guy for trying, right? What I've decided to do is I've tried to set up a little funky tripod thing um, with my little iPod Touch, and we're just going to look at the uh, Islanum tank um, while I talk uh, a little bit about the... Um, founder of the, well, one of the founders of the ACA, the guy that really made the thing work, guy by the name of Guy Jordan. And everybody who um, keeps Central American cichlids, South American cichlids, even to some extent African cichlids, owes a huge debt of gratitude to Guy Jordan. Um, Guy was really my mentor. Um, I got in contact with Guy uh, right out of college in the mid-1970s. Um, the ACA had started in oh, the late 60s uh, by a, a small group of people in San Diego who were all kind of uh, big into fish and, you know, the local San Diego scene. Dick Stratton uh, was re really the original founder of the ACA, if memory serves me right. And uh, Guy was one of the original guys in the uh, club. Well... Um, Guy was a lot more, let's just say, into it than uh, Dick and the rest of them, and the club was kind of floundering. And uh, Guy took it over, and uh, you know he became like the membership chairman, the editor, uh, bill collector, you name it. He did everything, and uh, with his um, incessant. Uh, fortitude and skills and um, likableness and all the rest of that stuff and just his desire to see it grow, the ACA grow in, grew into uh, the organization that it is today. At one time it had close to 2,000 members. I'm not sure what the ACA's membership is these days. Things are a lot different now with the internet. Of course now you can get almost any fish you want, um, look up on the internet and you know, get videos and photos and find where the fish are located and the whole bit. Back in the uh, 60s, that wasn't the case. Um, certainly uh, in the mid-70s when I got into this, um, finding information uh, was extremely difficult. And that's how I turned to Guy and the ACA. Um, so, sit back. What I thought I'd do today is I've got some... The way we used to communicate back in the early days prior to the internet and even prior to um, you know being able to use your phone um, as a really a communication medium because long distance calls were very expensive back in the 70s and to call San Diego or N New York or wherever and talk to somebody on a regular basis for 20-30 minutes a day uh, was cost prohibitive so the only real way to do this back in those days was with, was with cassette tapes. And um, that's really how I grew my knowledge of cichlids to begin with. Um, I started what we used to call tape bonding. And the first person I tape bonded with was Guy Jordan. And um, I have kept all those tapes over the years, and I've got several dozen of them. Um, Guy passed away, of course, many years ago. And I thought it might be kind of fun to uh, randomly pull out some of these tapes um, over time and let you guys hear how things used to be in the, uh, in the hobby. So what I thought I'd do is I'd put this camera in front of this one random Islanum tank. It's a 270-gallon tank. And you'll see various uh, Islanums uh, from three weeks, four weeks old, uh, up to uh, seven, eight years old, swimming by. I've got many pairs. And I thought we'd just watch these fish while I played a short excerpt excerpt from um, one of the, probably the first tape I got from Guy. And this is just uh, five, six minutes of Guy Jordan. Again, uh, really the guy that is responsible. It's kind of funny his name's Guy. and He's, he's the guy responsible for uh, for the hobby as we know it today. So without further ado, hopefully this works, I'm going to uh, stop talking 
and let you guys listen to a couple of uh, minutes of Guy Jordan talking. And here we go. But see yeah. So I still haven't got rid of all those duties that I used to have there. I used to put in just about eight hour days for a while there. Well, I'm just wondering how much kind of capacity you actually have there. I don't really have a good idea. You mentioned the hundred and fifty there, just waiting for a bunch of fry. Which is great. Uh, I don't really know uh, how many other things you have, how many of these big sacred you're trying to get. And believe me, uh, <laughs> it's easy to take care of a lot of them when they're little, but some of them get awfully uh, big. I would be interested in hearing about uh, some of your uh, the species you have, about you know, the dovii, how big they are, how old or something to that effect, how you're taking care of those, the name of the monoguancy. Uh, devils and that type of thing. I, uh, I've had, uh, I guess, just about uh, all those fairly, uh, well, piss that were fairly common at one time. Uh, we know how the sacred hobby is and the feast or famine. One time I was raising hundreds of uh, Centrarchus and had everybody in San Diego that wanted Centrarchus loaded down with them. A lot of them went off to the East Coast and other places. Same with bike belts. Here are two lakes, uh, Neatropus, Monaguense, uh, Dovii, just a lot of things like that. Gene Davies, who was a friend of mine, uh, was, we worked together on a lot of things. She had more tank space than I did, actually. Sometimes I'd take fish up to her house and bring my fish up there. Sometimes uh, one parent would be uh, one of my fish and the other would be one of hers. Sometimes they'd both be hers. So we should have turned out a lot of fish, both at her house and here. Uh, gosh, uh, she, had, she had a lot of tanks there. She had a, still has, I guess, 250, which is a beautiful job. Uh, you know, one of those wood uh, tanks with a glass front. It's a tremendous thing, and uh, keep a lot of big fish in a tank like that. And she had a 75 and two 70s, and it uh, must have been a half a dozen 50s. And with two 45s, 33s, some 30s. Uh, Some of those uh, stack tanks, the breeding breeder type, uh, not breeder, but growing type price, I think, where you get a, one of these racks with three or four tanks all on one rack, and one above the other. She had a couple of stacks of those. And uh, I have no idea how many 15s and 10s and things like that she had. Uh, they use for little tiny fry a lot of times. Not a bad idea to put tiny fry, and I mean real tiny, like just a few days old. And those smaller tanks, they seem to find their food better and seem to be less frightened and all that sort of thing. They seem to do a little better in the time they get up to the uh, inch or so and put them in. Uh, and the larger tanks that grow them. We're great believers in water changing. The more water you can change, the more even your growth is going to be. And uh, the less trouble you're going to have with uh, disease and uh, weakness of any kind of the fish. But we 
way things, the real way things, you know, probably disappear pretty quickly anyhow. And those you have left, if you start out with three or four hundred fry, uh, if you get, you know, good treatment and all that sort of thing, you might be able to raise pretty close to your three or four hundred and all be just about uniform. But that re requires almost 90% uh, water change every day, which is too much for most people. She did that with a couple spines, and uh, boy, I'm telling you, really got some tremendous growth and uh, stamina in those days. The real weakening, we couldn't take that, and they just didn't last. Those that did were really good fish. So uh, we were believe in a lot of water changes. Uh, quite different than the way it was 30 years ago. I remember back in 1949 and 50 when a lot of people would show you their tanks and say, boy, there has been a drop of water taken out of this tank for 10 years or five years, and uh, it was so acid it would be kind of yellowish, and the fish and plants wouldn't be doing that well either. Yeah. People thought that was, that was great. Actually, uh, pretty, even though the water was filtered and kept clear and everything, it's still awful bad water. Chemically, it was horrible. Uh, we've learned a lot better the last 15 years. An awful lot of improvement has been made in a lot of different areas. And uh, consequently, uh, for the most part, uh, fish are much better off now than they were even 15, 20 years ago. Have you uh, been doing much in the way of braiding fish right Well, that was just a brief clip of, um, let me get that off of there, of uh, Guy Jordan. Again, uh, that was the first tape I ever had from him. I'd love to hear some comments from people to see if um, you guys are in, enjoy listening to um, the founder, the guy who got the ACA going. Um, the guy who mentored me and taught me most everything I know about cichlids and um, got my, my, me started in being able to find and acquire fish like dovi and um, the black belts and true green terrors and boy you name it, freds and motoguens and monoguens and any all kinds of stuff. Anyway. I don't know how the audio quality is going to be on this one, but um, I thought I'd give it a shot. If uh, it's worth, if everybody thinks it's worthwhile, and I do love to hear your um, opinions up or down, um, I will go through these tapes and um, select little snippets of uh, tape bonding and um, play them while I show some fish. And then you guys can hear uh, directly from... Uh, the master. Um, somebody had left a comment on one of my videos when I started making them again that uh, the Godfather had returned and I, I appreciated the compliment but uh, the true Godfather of American cichlids is Guy Jordan. With that I will leave you. Take care. <laughs>